What's up guys? Welcome to the review and theory crafting video for Season 7, Episode 4, The Spoils of War. From the beginning, we are taken to The Spoils of War, displaying before us the caravan established to getting the raided gold from Highgarden back to King's Landing. Jamie stops the wagon, opens the back, and gives Bronn a large sack of gold, reminding us that he is still just a mercenary. Bronn accepts and moves the conversation to his due amount, stating that it's not a castle. If you recall, Bronn has a promised bride and will have a castle once he kills her older sister. However, in Season 5, Jamie convinces Bronn to assist him on a mission to Dorne. He assures that he will find him a better bride and an even bigger castle. So Bronn suggests he could be rewarded Highgarden. Jamie says, no, it's too risky, but this could could mean multiple things. It could mean he doesn't wish to give Bronn control of a resource he can produce so much gold from, or he does in fact care for Bronn and states that it could easily be retaken at a time of war. We then travel to King's Landing where Cersei and the Iron Bank representative eagerly await their gold. He expresses to her that the Iron Bank can represent them again once the gold arrives. Cersei states that Quyburn has sent word to the Golden Company in an attempt to increase her army size. Quite an interesting one. If you care to take the time, look into it. I won't go into depth because I don't think the scope of the television show will really invest into their backstory. The importance of this group is that they are a very large army, multiple sources stating roughly around 10,000 strong, and they are are cell swords. So having the Iron Bank backing Cersei, we will most certainly see them hired to fight in battles to come. She then goes on to say, I too would like them to recover some things that belong to me. So what could she be talking about here? What things does she hope to recover? Listening to the entire conversation in its completion, she could be talking about recovering land or kingdoms that she lost. My only venture at this moment is re-establishing control over this continent and every person on it. So, with that in mind, my theory is that she will use the Golden Company to reclaim Castle Rock, Dragonstone, or Winterfell. Another battle by Castle Rock would be amazing. I expressed in my previous video how I hated how short the siege was, you know, of a legendary castle as it was. But what does that do for the plot? Attacking Dragonstone would be a pretty neat twist. Cersei going on the offensive, attacking at their base of operations would be outstanding. But is she really going to hire sellswords to attack a castle that's surrounded by dragons? I'm really not sure about that. And finally, Winterfell. I see this as a possibility only because I doubt Cersei understands the real threat in the north and wants to put out the possibility that Jon could be helping Danny at some point. But this could also lead to something pretty amazing. Say they go to attack Jon. They get there, Jon convinces them of the real danger, and boom. All of a sudden, Jon has his reinforcements. This would be quite the turn of events, but... I'm not ruling it out. Back to the review. We have Littlefinger and Brandon Stark. Littlefinger gives Bran the blade that once threatened to take his life, something quite symbolic about this scene that I really enjoy. The blade is Valyrian steel, able to kill White Walkers. However, as the scene plays on, this occurs. Make your way home again, only to find such chaos. Chaos is a ladder. Bran is referencing Littlefinger saying this previously, and damn, it scares him. Bran likely knows of the evil that Littlefinger has done. Guessing what Bran knows is quite difficult, however, uh, he has a wealth of information at his disposal, but from his own words, it comes in blocks and flashes. Once he hones his skills, we'll likely see the more omniscient Three-Eyed Raven. From this, we have to be cautious of Littlefinger. If he suspects that Bran will thwart his endgame in any way, he may try to silence him. Then Mira enters, confessing she is leaving, for when the Night King comes, she wants to be with her family. He simply sees her off and thinks nothing of it. But these two have been together for a while now. She's lost loved ones just so he can become what he is today. And he replies with, Alright, thanks, see you around. But more importantly, this is when we learn that Bran really isn't Bran. He's a vessel hosting the Three-Eyed Raven. I'm not really. Not anymore. I remember what it felt like to be Brandon stuff. But I remember so much else now. He remembers the feelings of Brandon Stark, but there's so much other information that comes to mind, he doesn't know how to act towards his friend's departure. My brother died for you. Hodor and Summer died for you. I almost died for you. Thank you. Then Arya arrives back at Winterfell. After dealing with Beavis and Butthead, she arrives at the crypts, finally seeing the resting place of her father. She reunites with Sansa, the two have been through so much, and their relationship will certainly be much different than it was before. At the time, they were just two young sisters who fought with each other constantly, but now they stand as figureheads of a powerful family name ready to do whatever is required to remain secure. Arya mentions her list, and Sansa doesn't think much of it, laughs it off in fact. 
Arya then reunites with Bran, and he seems distant, but as we know, it isn't truly Bran anymore. But he questions why Arya didn't go south, and brings up the list. Sansa wants to know more about this list, and Arya simply replies that most of them are already dead. They then bring up the dagger. Bran, in short, gives the dagger to Arya. Back at Dragonstone, two girls giggle about boys. Then John takes Danny down to view his big dragon glass. John finds carvings showing the first men and children of the forest united together against the White Walkers. These images of the undead army most likely convince Danny that John isn't out of his mind. He references this requesting her aid again, but she simply cannot help without him bending the knee. More so, with everything in consideration, he won't be able to pledge to a southern ruler. Then Danny learns they took Castle Rock, but lost the entire army of Highgarden, making her total number of allies simply the Unsullied, who are stranded on the other side of Westeros and the Dothraki. Furious that she continues losing with the counsel of the enemy's little brother, she questions why she doesn't just ride into the Red Keep and Mad King the place. She turns to Jon for guidance, and he humbly reinforces that that's not the way to go. Then back at Winterfell, Podrick continues getting worked. Arya wishes to train with Brienne. The scene is quite warming. She wishes just to show the greatest warrior she's ever known, the only one that's been able to defeat the Hound, that she's grown and become something great as well. It also shows Sansa that her little sister is a badass. Arya and Littlefinger make eye contact for the first time at Winterfell, and I don't believe that she trusts him, as rightfully so. Back again at Dragonstone, Theon arrives with the remaining Greyjoys, and Jon confronts him, stating that he should kill him for what he had done, but because he helped Sansa, he would be spared. Theon tells Jon he needs to speak with the Queen because he wants a rest mission. Called it. Theon will hopefully get to die a hero. A bittersweet end. That's right, boys and girls, action time. Before I start the breakdown, important information exists in the very first quoted line. All the gold safely through the gates of King's Landing. Good. That's right, the gold is back at King's Landing, meaning the Iron Bank debt is paid and everything that comes with it. Based on Randall's statement about the Blackwater Rush, we can deduce that they are rather close to King's Landing. They made the majority of their trip back before this attack happened. But nevertheless, it does in fact happen. Jamie and Randall scramble to get their forces in position as the Dothraki charge. Then Daenerys makes a pass, setting the field ablaze. We find that Jamie conveniently also is in possession of one of Quyburn's weapons, called the Scorpion. Bronn manages to wing the large dragon, bringing it down to the ground, but by no means is it a fatal harm. As the creature lie on the ground, Jaime sees the opportunity to deliver the killing blow, but as he draws near, the dragon turns, defending its mother, charge flame toward Jaime. Thankfully, right at the last second, Bronn tackles Jaime off of the horse and into the water, where the scene ends with him sinking to the bottom. Uh, of course, he is sinking because of his armor. Something I'd like to note is that as Jamie charges, we hear Tyrion wishing for his brother to flee, you know, so he doesn't die, that he's a fool for going at him. But what comes from this is that it'll be interesting once Tyrion has to decide between his love for his brother and his love for Daenerys. With this episode, guys, my mind is going crazy with theories. I can't wait to get videos made in the coming days. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please share it. Uh, more than anything, that will help grow this channel. Much love, everybody. Thanks again. So, Jamie. Rick on. Dick on. Ha, ha, ha.